Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Toku Titan Cast. My name is Davis Vidal, also known as Titan Goji, content creator on YouTube. And it is a huge honor to have the one, the only, Jason Lyles. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Davis. Thanks for having me, man. I'm I'm no big deal. I'm just a tall nerd who's had some some fun opportunities, but I'm excited to chat today and help out in any way I can and talk about some fun stuff. Jason Lyles is an actor who usually portrays creatures in either full body costumes or motion capture as seen in big Hollywood blockbusters like Rampage, where he portrayed George, the albino gorilla, and Godzilla, King of the Monsters, where he played the middle head of King Ghidorah, as well as Rodan. Jason is even in films that are home to streaming services, such as when he provided the movements of Ryuk in Netflix's Death Note, and can be seen as Chatterer from 2022's Hellraiser, available on Hulu. What got me interested in becoming an actor was I, as far back as I can remember, was watching movies, whether it was all the Star Wars movies on the VHS tapes back in the day before they were edited and added with all the stuff in it, which is great, but the untouched versions and then Indiana Jones and just so many movies growing up, all the Spielberg movies and from the 80s and 90s and, and going to movie theaters. There was, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and there was the Forest Hill Cinema, there was the Carrierville Town Cinema, and I just have so many memories going there, specifically with my dad and my brother, and just watching movie after movie after movie, always excited to see what posters are on the wall, what's coming up next. So I, I really was immersed in movies, and this was of course back before the internet, and so I just, that's really something that I, I dreamt of. I really dreamt, literally, I remember having a dream when I was a kid of being in Star Wars. It's like, man, it'd be so cool. And and I just never really believed that I could because no one says they're gonna move to Memphis, Tennessee and become an actor, right? So I didn't really know anybody <laughs> around and I didn't do theater. I just never believed I could, so I never tried. I just thought these people were, for, were from, from somewhere else. And my brother got into filmmaking and part of the video club in middle school and high school and. And they had his high school that he went to, Germantown High School, had a multi-million dollar video production studio. And so he got a handy cam that had like little cassette tapes that were the size of like a business card. And we got it around the time of Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, when that came out. And just remember that they were very tight and that it was probably in the same year. And we just made short films. We didn't ever really have a script. We just had an idea. We just started shooting around the house and shooting outside. And I loved that. But I figured that's as far as it would ever go. And as I got older, and I got into college. I was working at Blockbuster and The Dark Knight was coming out. And I wasn't particularly a Heath Ledger fan, but obviously it passed away earlier that year and it came out and I saw the movie six times in the first two weeks. I just couldn't get enough of it. It was such a spectacle and the, uh, the audience, it was like a ride, people reacting to the Joker. and. I was so inspired by Andy Serkis and Lord of the Rings before that and just devoured all the behind the scenes and something just told me I gotta freaking go after this. I was so inspired. I watched, I rented every Heath Ledger movie and I was like, I gotta do this and um, I ended up studying in college. Never finished my degree but studied and then I, I, my parents saw how seriously I was taking it and we discussed how, you know, what the next move would be and we moved to, they helped me move to New York. I studied there for six years and then other stuff happened we can get into, but then it led me to LA. I've been here for eight years now, and I have failed a ton and grown and gotten around people who were, who were kind enough to help, and here we are. Never thought that I'd be any of these characters and be a character on a poster of a movie that's, you know, or any of this stuff, and I hoped and dreamt, but if you, if you have enough effort, if you take a talent and you put enough effort with it, eventually you're gonna develop a skill. You might not be the best, but you, you can be great at anything. You put enough time and effort in, and then you take that skill and you combine that with more effort, you're going to have one achievement, a second achievement, a third, a lot of failures around along the way, but 
you know, it's, just, it's, it's like with any sport, you practice it long enough, you're going to hit the ball, you're going to make a shot, you're going to score a goal. You just have to freaking suck for a long time and enjoy it and get better and get better and get better and better and better and better and better. And, better. and that was actually something in an interview I heard Heath Ledger say when I was so obsessed with him. He said, I've failed thousands of times. And I was like, where? Like, none of those takes are in the movies. They're perfect. <laughs> we don't see all those years of someone never trying before, starting and sucking, getting better, better, better. We just see them win an Oscar or something, and we think they're a genius. No, they've been working for 10, 20 years at their craft. Michael Phelps didn't just get in the pool and be like, oh, I guess I'm a fish. No, he worked four hours in the pool for like 12 hours a day, and then he won gold medals. So it's, it's time and effort in getting around people who have the results you want. big big one was Doug Jones and if people oh, don't know yeah. that name you do but he he's this guy in Pan's Labyrinth he's he's in Shape of Water he Hellboy. is Hellboy Star Trek Discovery Hocus Pocus 150 different things he is the go-to guy and I saw when I discovered that I'm not too tall I'm great for those types of roles Chewbacca Predator all these types of creatures and monsters when I discovered that which took a few years to discover, I saw he was the best. And I just, I watched his stuff and it literally, for a lot of short films and even for Death Note, I just really thought about how would Doug do this? What would he do? What character can I base this off of that he did? Just steal from the best, all of them do it. But then he and I also got to work on a, on a short film together and, and became really good friends and he became a mentor of mine. And so he, he gave me some really good nuggets of advice. But yeah, Doug was a big one. It was a short film, it was an NYU student thesis film called I Helios. Oh, okay. And Doug, Doug played this human who this bead of light grows in his hand every day. And not every day, but over time, and he has to cut it out. He lives in a windowless, doorless room. He's been there his whole life. So he's maybe in his 30s or 40s, but he's like a baby, he doesn't know anything. And so he just, he, he takes it out and creates this thing and puts it in a thing on the wall and just is there all the time. And one day he accidentally finds his way out and he gets out into the woods and he gets out into the, into the wow, it's like a baby for the first time and he comes across this creature. So they needed someone taller than him and we have this fight to the death and so we're the only two in the film. And so we became very good friends and, and I only got that because I had done another NYU student film like six months earlier where I played the teacher in the scene for like 60 seconds and that director was in the same class as this director and he was like i need somebody to uh, and she was like i just worked with this guy who's six foot nine he'd be he'd probably be perfect i think he was in men in black three so he's already played aliens and whatnot he'd be perfect for this um and um and i was obsessed with doug at that point and so when i got an email saying hey i got your email from such and such i'm doing a short film and this is thing i'd be filming these couple of days and um, and yeah, you'd be, here's who, who also is in it, Doug Jones with an IMDb link. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then like, well, Doug and Jones are very common first and last names. So it's probably can't be. And I was like, it was him. Like, yeah, just, you'd fight him to the death. And you know, just wanted to see if you wanted to do it. Dude, when you go after things for years and you're trying and trying and trying and trying, God or the universe or whatever you believe just sometimes goes, there you go. <laughs> no big deal. No big deal. That's for you. It's wow. I have, I have a lot of stories like it's crazy, man. You, the, I think Richard Branson said, someone asked him, do you think you're luckier than other people? Or do you think you're lucky? He said, oh, I'm very, very lucky, but I'm no luckier than anyone else. And it's crazy. The longer and harder I work, the luckier I get. I did. I don't even know, a couple dozen NYU student films or, or New York Film Academy short or, stu or short films or whatever when I was in New York, literally whatever I could get on, whatever I could get on, any experience I could get. The best experience I probably had there were these, the NYU. If someone's in New York and they're trying to do short films or student films, get in these NYU films. Where? Backstage.com, Actors Access, Casting Networks, wherever you can. The NYU are just in another tier. I mean, literally, like the year before that, one had won an Oscar for best short film. So I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in these NYU films. 
they're just they're they're the yeah the quality are huge but every film is a little different i mean you know you have the basic crew there of lighting and camera and micro mic and all that all that all those different departments and what sound and everything um they're all totally different i helios was a big one because the the crew was pretty big for for a studio film. it was like 20 or 30 people we actually got they actually built some sets in a studio for this we went out in and shot they had amazing equipment they knew what they were doing um there's so many and then yeah shallow water was a was a the biggest budget short film i've ever worked on directed by um sandy calora and that was a great experience i mean he, sandy calora is a great filmmaker he's a great guy a great leader and he brought on some phenomenal i'm not even gonna start to name names he brought on some some great people onto this whether it was in front of the camera or other actors playing the monsters whether it was the uh, you know the leads, the the crew, it was, these people were serious and that was a challenge. We, we filmed some of that, whether it was a hundred degree heat in the like old jungle type areas of California, which I didn't really know existed, really, really hot, really, really swampy and gross. And, or we were out in Arizona, I think it was in Lake, ha was it Arizona? Lake Havasu. And we were there in December when the water was 50 degrees, five zero, which is extremely freaking cold. If you've never been in water that cold, I did not anticipate that. I thought it was the same as air temperature. No, it's a lot colder. And we were in it for like four hours one day and I could not feel anything. <laughs> like, wow. it took me like two hours afterwards after we got out for me to be able to like move my toes and feel them, <sighs> start to feel them. Um, that was cold. And, and, then, and, then, and then act, action, right? <laughs> um, so it was, They've all been, they're all great experiences. I could talk about all of them for quite a while, but they're, each one I learned something from, each one I built belief, each one I built confidence. You never know where you're gonna be one person that leads to this, to this, to this, to this, to this, to a huge opportunity 10 years down the road. You never know, and that was something, when I lived in New York, I went to Broadway stage doors and would ask actors for advice, whether it was Jude Law or Jeffrey Rush or Ian McKellen or Patrick Stewart or Hugh Jackman or Brian Cranston or Oliver Platt. I have so many different things. I remember exactly what they all said. And Oliver Platt said, um, say yes to everything at first because you never know where one tiny little thing is gonna lead. Someone on that produces something major 10 years down the road. And you did great on that and they loved working with you and, they, and you were accountable and you worked hard and you had a great attitude and they liked you and they remember you 10 years later or you keep in touch with your friends for the next 10 years. You just never know. I cried. I was so happy I could, that I got the opportunity I mean, you have to imagine just building the belief that I could even go after this and finally moving to New York in 2009 and then having no idea what I'm doing, no idea where to go. How do I get an acting job? How do I get an agent? How do I get a manager? How do I get in something? How do I get on a set? And just slowly over six years, getting some opportunities, just throwing mud against the wall and trying everything and asking everybody for help and going to Q and A's and going to just any little nugget, watching interviews, anything I could get. I just, I just want to be, man, man, I just want my name. And then not, not because I want my name there, but because it's a role that I booked that's big enough or important enough, not just back, I did background for years, but is actually a role where I'm on a show, I'm in a movie, I just, I want an IMDb credit in a movie or a show, come on, you know, and and that's the big thing, I just want an IMDb credit. Um, and then I, 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 what made me move to LA was I met all these makeup artists who said, dude, you're six foot nine, the, how many people are six and a half feet taller, taller, your build, they're taking it seriously, you have experience working on Men in Black 3 with seven time Oscar winner Rick Baker, you worked with Doug Jones, dude, if you were out here in LA half the time when stuff comes up, we could just get you in. It's not going to be your face. It's probably not going to be your voice. You just need to be local and be able to come in for the fitting. So I moved out here and I was working and work every day, man. How can I grow? How can I get in better shape? I was preparing, preparing. And one of the people say, hey, you know, I get an email. What are you doing the next four months? I was like, Outback Steakhouse. Why? What's up? <laughs> and they said, well, there's this thing we're working on. Can you come in? This is a Saturday. Can you come in Monday? I go in and there's this big Ryuk puppet you know like eight nine feet tall and so the puppet didn't work 
and like, well, we need a guy. It's called Death Note. I was like, okay, Death Note. Let me look that up. Um, I didn't, I didn't know what it was, and they said, yeah, you know, we're gonna see. Maybe we can get you a meeting or something. I go back and I tell my roommate at the time, Adam. He's like, Death Note. They're making a Death Note movie. What? He's like, dude, that's like my favorite anime. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then I get an audition, and I put it all in the freaking line. I rehearsed this thing in front of my laptop camera 50 times this scene until it was perfect in my mind, my idea of it. And I went in and I did it and I felt so good. And the casting assistant was blown away. Like, dude, no one's done this like this all day. That was amazing. That was the best thing anyone's ever done it. No one says that at a casting. I was like, oh my gosh. And then I get a call back and I go in and I, I do it. And then a couple days later, I get, you're the director's first choice. You're going, to, you're going to Canada for three months. I cried. And I just, I did not want to work at Outback Steakhouse that weekend at all. I was like, I want to quit right now. <laughs> and, and then I go up there and then they tell me, you know, we're looking at, at Willem Dafoe for the voice. <gasps> oh my gosh, are you serious? <laughs> and then a week later, they're like, we got Willem. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. And I just, I remember being in my apartment beautiful apartment they put me in like 10 floors up overlooking all of Vancouver to watch the sunset from there it was crazy it was such it was a dream come true I was like I can't believe this is happening I got flown first class up there and and I just I just rehearsing my scenes like crazy and just recording the other parts of the scene on on my phone and playing and walking through it around my apartment and just I'm gonna get on set I'm gonna be I'm gonna I'm gonna have all this down and I learned a lot on that film but day in and day out, it was incredible. It was incredible that I, I think I was on set second only behind Nat Wolf who played Light as far as days on set. It's like 25 days on set or something out of the whole time I was up there. So I got to explore the city and eat food and go hiking, awesome hiking in Vancouver. Um, my wife was my girlfriend at the time. She came up and spent a month up there with me. And so that kind of shows like, wow, this is okay. Wow, we really love each other. This is awesome, you know? We're living together and every day is incredible. And it was a dream come true. It was it was what it was seven years after I moved to New York, six years in New York, then one year in LA. That finally, that was my first film or show I was credited in, and I was so grateful. And I took it so seriously, and I worked my freaking butt off, and I felt so great about it. Um, and that's where I met Colin Strauss, the visual effects supervisor, who ended up getting me in the room for Rampage. And he's the reason that I got that I got the opportunity for Rampage because I worked on that film and he and I became good friends. He ended up being one of my groomsmen in my wedding and um, I'll get into that when I get to Rampage. But it was it was a dream come true. And um, and as soon as it was over, I was like, crap, where's the where's the next gig? What am I going to do now? Because it's over. The paychecks have stopped. Netflix is trying to give Death Note another shot with yes. the uh, Duffer Brothers behind Stranger Things. Is there a chance that we could maybe see you as Ryuk again in the future? I would beyond love to. I had heard after the after Death Note came out because of how many people watched it within the first 48 hours, immediately so many people watched it that Netflix was like, we, we want to make more. We want to make sequels. Well, now evidently that has turned into they want the Duffer Brothers to make a series. So I imagine the Duffer Brothers, it's totally their decision whoever's going to play Ryuk it is it might be a completely different route I have no idea if it's going to be the same Ryuk from this but in a different world or if it's just a completely oh complete overhaul I've heard zero but I'm a huge fan of the Duffer Brothers I've watched every episode of Stranger Things and I can just imagine you take that dark tone that they have with Stranger Things and the ability they have to work with with teenagers and and, and to be able to really get great performances out and tell incredible stories. And you put that in the world of Death Note as a live action series, I think it's gonna be, I think it's freaking perfect. And so I am trying to, someone knows them, I'm trying to get in touch with them right now. <laughs> because I I want I want to be, if they're, I mean, if they don't know that I played Ryu, which I'm sure they probably do, but um, that would be a dream role because I love Ryu. I love you. And the idea of playing him throughout a, a, even just one season, if not multiple seasons of a series, he's such a fun character. He's untouchable. No one can touch him. He's just there watching, having fun. <laughs> it's, it's like a cat just watching the entertainment, eating popcorn, just seeing what's going to happen. You can't, you can't touch him. 
Like, what? He's a death god. What are you going to do? He's yeah. just, he's bored. He's like, oh, this is cool. I wonder what these humans are going to do with this. Um, I would love to. I would love to. I'll get into how how Rampage even happened. I heard about it the whole time on Death Note. Because Colin Strauss, the visual effects supervisor for Death Note, kept saying this was the next movie he was doing. And he had done a couple movies with... He had done San Andreas. He had just done Baywatch. He'd done some movies with him before. And I was like, cool. But then when we got back to town from Death Note afterwards, a month or two after, I was at his house for a barbecue. I was at his house for a barbecue every couple of weeks. But one day he's flipping burgers and steaks. And he says, hey, what do you know about Silverback Gorillas? I don't know anything. It's like, well, they're looking for someone taller than Dwayne to play this gorilla that he raises from birth and he teaches sign language and, you know, looking for so, you know, so I'm, I'm going to tell him you're my number one choice. Uh, he said they're probably going to get Andy Serkis to do most of the film, but there's one or two scenes at the beginning where they need someone taller before he starts to grow. So I was like, oh, okay, well, that'd be amazing. A couple weeks and share a character with Andy Serkis. Oh my gosh. A couple months goes by and he finally gets, he gets me a meeting and no, they're looking at me for the whole movie. Okay. What? Wow. Okay. And they said, yeah, they're going to have you meet with Terry Notary. And I reached out to Terry because I knew who he was. I was trying to get some help from him a few months prior to prepare for this. And he was busy prepping for Infinity War and Endgame and coaching half a dozen people on there, playing characters on there, coaching um, Josh Brolin as Thanos. And they said, yeah, you're going to meet with him. He would train you for several weeks. So we meet and he gives thumbs up. And he says, yeah, let's see. You know, I got a spot in the mountains we can train. I was like, I'm sorry, do I have this role? Like, what? I just had it. It was that simple. And then he trained me to become a gorilla for three weeks in the mountains and every day. And then we went, we went and rehearsed in Atlanta. And then he said, dude, you got it. You're George. Go for it, bro. Uh, well, I mean, I already had the role, but we had found it. I was, I was like a newborn giraffe for the first week or so learning how to be a gorilla. And... And then getting on it, I remember the first time I met I met Dwayne, we were kind of rehearsing some of the mocap technology, making sure it all worked on the first set, which was inside the, the lab where George is like saying hungry, hungry before he breaks down the entire big wall gate and then breaks out into, into the zoo parking lot and all that. Um, so we were inside and I see Dwayne through the glass into the next room. And he kind of gives me a, hi, hey, you know, gives me a wave. And I'm like, hi. And he comes in and we say, hey guys, we need to clear out. They're going to take some pictures. And, um, and, uh, and, I, and I met him. I was like, dude, we're, hey, we're going to be friends for a couple months. And he's like, well, just for a couple months. And then that's it. You know, and, and I said, that's right. Yeah. And I said, well, hey, and, and then he starts walking past me. And he said, well, hold, hold on. He should stay, right? In case we get pictures, you should stay. In case we, uh, and I was like, okay. And, so they're getting a picture of him in the cage and they're kind of messing with him. Like, yeah, get it in Dwayne. He's like, shut up. Okay. Yeah. And, they, and they're like, yep, it's very serious DJ. He's like, shut up, shut up, shut up. They're always, he, he has such a great attitude and sense of humor. Um, <laughs> and so on the other side of the room, I'm getting into it. How Terry taught me and pacing around on all fours and breathing and, and getting into George. And he stops everybody. And he says, that's, freaking amazing he said something else but we need to get him in the photo in the photo and so then that's that picture of him standing by the cage and me standing out in front of it right next to him that he posted everywhere and was the first photo that came up and he posted that the next day on his birthday um and my phone exploded because no one knew what i was doing because i didn't tell anybody my phone exploded for a couple days um people were messaging me from all over the world i saw dwayne johnson's post and it's crazy and just his support that first day the first couple of days meant so much to me and i went up to him after we took that picture before any of that happened and i was like dude we make this movie one time first he was like how did you learn how to do that and i told him about terry he said that's amazing that's phenomenal and i was like dude we make this movie one time he said yes i was like dude look, we need to we need to crush this one day at a time man we're han and chewy and, and he says we are han and chewy i said we are right they do one day at a time. Let's freaking crush this fist bump. I mean, we, we hugged and fist bumped all day, every day. He, I <laughs> love him to death. And um, throughout that whole filming experience, man, I mean, the action sequences I got to go through. I mean, when you see George there in the movie, I'm there. I'm doing that. And Weta bringing it through through visual effects is just un, 
believable. Um, I mean, everything from when he's normal size to baby gorilla is me. Baby George is me as well. Underneath, there's a little clip. There's a flashback. Um, and and all the way up to him being King Kong size and crashing through buildings and uh, fighting, you know, fighting that giant gator. And um, But the, the relationship that I built with, with DJ was just life-changing. And getting around someone like that who's so humble and works so hard and and just has such a great attitude and such a big heart. You hope he's this cool. Oh man, he looks so cool in his Instagram post. And I hope he's that cool. He's that cool. He's so nice. He's nicer than you would ever hope or pray or wish. And I just can't say enough good things about him. And, and then and then the, the final day, it's the last scene of the film with George and with Davis. And and we rap at the exact same time. We, we shot it and like, and that is a rap on Dwayne Johnson Day. And, and, you know, he says something, it's his third movie with the director, Brad Payton. And um, he gifted Brad a massive rampage, like a massive, legit rampage arcade as a gift. Wow. <laughs> and he's like, hey, you know, and all this. And, and I'm standing over there and, you know, like when you're really emotional and you're about to cry, but as long as you just keep your mouth shut and you don't like say anything, you won't cry. But if you start talking, you're just going to start like you just, it's just, it's going to, I felt that behind the whole time he was talking, I felt that behind a floodgate. And I was like, I need to get this under control because I know somebody's going to say, and Jason too, you know, and, um, and Dwayne, you know, and everyone, he finishes his speech and everyone's like, yay. And he's like, oh, 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 Jason. And I'm, and, and. And I start talking, and I just start crying. And I say, <laughs> I say, I, I literally start by saying, like, I'm probably going to start crying. So, And I just say that this is only my second movie. I know a lot of people have been doing this a lot longer than I have. I never thought this would come true. I never thought I'd get to be on an opportunity like this. I can't believe this happened. I'm so grateful, and it was such a dream come true. So just thank you to everybody around me. And, but it was all well, this thank you so much. Like, I just could not. And, um, and Dwayne is right in front of me, just like a coach, a dad, a brother, just like, and then as soon as I'm done, he's like, yeah, he just started, he's saying, he comes over with a big <laughs> hug. And then the next day I get emailed from one of the producer's assistants. Hey, Dwayne wanted you to have this. One of the producers had recorded the whole thing on their phone. And so I have it. Wow. And literally he has like on this, on, on this side of the camera, me on this side of the camera, Dwayne and the whole thing. And then the hug at the end and everything. And it's like, it's one of my favorite videos that I have. And, um, I love that. And then, and then he goes into interviews and he starts talking about all oh, the movie is great. Let me tell you about Jason Lyles. He's six foot nine. And he, and, and all my friends are like, he's talking about you on Jimmy Kimmel. And it was just, it was ridiculous. It was so crazy. It was such an incredible experience. And, um, I loved it. And then working with Weta, I've been such a fan of Weta workshop and digital. I didn't get to work with Weta workshop on that, but Weta digital since Lord of the Rings and all the behind the scenes. So to get to be like, the Andy Circus of this film with the same team that did Lord of the Rings and Planet of the Apes and King Kong and trained by Terry Note and working with one of my best friends to become my groomsman of visual effects supervisor Colin Strauss and every day with Dwayne Johnson and like having cool moments with him too like you know like just like quietly like hey man did you get any sleep last night he's like hell no man my daughter woke me up at like 3 a.m. and then I had to get up and worked out twice at some meetings and I came here. I'm so exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> like just getting to have that friendship with him. So I, um, death note was incredible because it was, I never thought I'd be able to have an opportunity like that at all. And I learned so much. I built confidence. I was so nervous at the beginning of that. I built confidence. I found out that I have an idea when you're coming to set, but you have no idea what's going to happen until you actually get on set. And they say, right. here's the camera. Here's your, I, like, there's a scene where Ryuk is, is sitting on the edge of the bed. And he's like, oh, what's with all these rules and all this and that and everything. And um, I had planned that whole scene, like pacing back and forth and all this moving. And they're like, oh, yeah, so you're just going to sit on the bed the whole time. I just sit here 
the whole time? Yeah, deliver everything from there. When you get on set, you're gonna figure it out. You're gonna try a bunch of stuff, they're gonna get the take, moving on. And so it built confidence. So when I got on Rampage, I knew I could do it. Terry's coaching with me. He was like Tony Hawk teaching me to go from, I couldn't be on a skateboard to three weeks later, I could do a 1080. So like, it just, it was an incredible growing experience. Um, I'll never forget it. And, and I love Dwayne Johnson so much. He's such a great guy and I can't wait to see him again. I haven't seen him in five years now since the, this is crazy how fast that went by. We, we intended to connect on in 2020 <laughs> but um, but I'm, I, I can't wait to see him again and give him a big hug and just squeeze him so tight. But I did end up meeting Andy Serkis a few months after we filmed because they were doing screenings with Q&As of War for Planet of the Apes because they were, I think they were trying to push for an Oscar nomination. And Joe Letary, who is the, I believe CEO, but like head visual effects supervisor, whatever the term would be, senior visual effects supervisor at Weta, with, with like five Oscars or something like that. Um, he was the he was the same position on Rampage. And then also for the Planet of the Apes films and King Kong, I think Lord of the Rings, all of it. He's ridiculous, he's so awesome. He was at the Q&A with Andy, as well as director Matt Reeves. And, and so I, I was able to get in touch with him and say, hey, I'm gonna be there. Can you introduce me to Andy? And he said, absolutely. I was like, oh my gosh. And I met a Andy and um, we got an Apes, Apes Together Strong picture. <laughs> uh, like we got a normal picture. I was like, dude, we got to get an ape to get a strong. Because Joe was telling him about Rampage, and Andy was like, what is this movie? I got to I gotta see this. Like, this is how Terry trained you? Oh, my gosh. So I don't know if you ever saw it. I haven't seen him since then. But, yeah, I would love, love, love to work with Andy. Which he said there. He said, it sounds like we're going to have to. And I was like, that would be great. Please. That'd be awesome. You have no idea. You have no idea. <laughs> So director Mike Doherty, I had auditioned for Krampus back in 2014. He liked me so much, he actually like got my cell phone number somehow through casting or something and just texted me one day, hey, watch this stuff. I'm like, who is this? <gasps> it's Mike Doherty, holy crap. And I didn't end up getting that because they ended up working um, out in New Zealand with the Weta Workshop and they hired, they're like, we're gonna cast locally out here. Um, and they got a guy named Luke Hawker who is phenomenal, such a cool dude, I've met him since. Uh, he's like a foot plus shorter than I am. <laughs> so, uh, they had a, so they ended up not going with someone tall at all. He's like 5'7", something like that. He's such a great guy. He works out when a workshop as well. And he's been in, uh, in several great films, but um, he'll, he'll make the stuff and then be in it. But Mike and I still kept in touch. And when the Rampage trailer came out, he texted me before I finished watching the trailer. I was like, how did you watch it faster? He said, cool work, man. And then a couple months later, he texted me at like midnight, like, hey, um, are you in town next month to do some Godzilla motion capture stuff? Yes, what, why? <laughs> we get on the phone and then he says, yeah, I want you to be the center head of, you know, there's gonna get, I'm gonna get three actors, da, 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 da. do you want it? Yeah, cool, give me your agent's info and I'll have, cool, we're gonna get to work together, man. That simple. And so that's just crazy. It's about who knows you and likes you and trusts you. And then I, when we got on set, it was just three days. It was three very short days, seven hour days. We didn't even reach eight hours, one single day. Really? Um, yeah, no overtime. We just got, the first day was supposed to be all rehearsal, but we started filming because uh, mainly it was rehearsal for me and Alan and Richard to figure out how are we gonna do the three of us together? Are we gonna tie each other together at the waist or at the feet? or not, we ended up not tying each other together at all. And we just, we just had each, our hands on each other's backs and just moved as one. And we just rehearsed, you know, bit by bit. Um, also really cool before we filmed that I got to go to Legendary's offices and Alan and Richard and I got to watch the version of Godzilla, King of the Monsters, where it was with like crappy PlayStation 2 type graphics in there, you know, for the visual effects. And we're sitting there watching the whole uh. movie, like a year before anyone else did. And we're like, this is so awesome. And then Richard's head gets bit off. We're like, oh, dang, you die. It starts to grow back. Oh, dude, you grow back? Oh my gosh. Like, it was so, just in this little theater in Legendary, it was so cool. And then Mike brought us in and was like, so any notes, anything we can do to make the movie better? And we're like, I wasn't expecting this. I was, um, let me think. And so we kind of gave some notes, but 
then filming it, yeah, we went and rehearsed for a couple hours, felt like we had it down, and um, you know, I did as much research as I could, just kind of figure out who this character was, who the middlehead was, because they were three different characters of one, basically. Three brothers, and I was kind of like the big brother, the alpha, and um, you know, looked at like Komodo dragons and snakes, and obviously watched other uh, older, older films of Godzilla films with Ghidorah in it, and and we went in and just played scene after scene. They would show us the scene on this big screen the size of a wall. Be like, cool, so we're gonna do A, B, C, D. Okay, and then we would just do it a few times, take some direction, great, move on to the next scene. And um, just, it was like fighting each other on the carpet. They were just like rolling around like monsters, rawr, and stuff. And um, imagine you're shooting beams out of your mouth and it was so much fun. It was so cool, and Mike is such a great director and has such a sense of play, and is such a great leader. And after three days, we'd gone through everything in the film. And then at the end of the third day, we shot the very last scene, where, where, where Godzilla's looking around at all the Titans. And I was like, I call Rodan, I'm gonna be Rodan. And like, we weren't gonna be actually playing them, we were just so he could have someone to look at. But mm, okay, I got into it. I was like, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be freaking Rodan here, man. And afterwards, Mike was like, Would you want to do like a couple Rodan scenes when we're done today? Like that was good. I was like, Yeah, absolutely. Are you serious? And so then I got to do, I think just the scene of Rodan when he comes up out of out of the volcano with his with his wings, and then he swoops down and um and. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Then we got to go to a bunch of conventions. We have one coming up. I'll, I'll, I'll give the dates at the end. We were done, and then we then we saw the trailer come out um, the next year. Or no, that, su that summer. We saw it come out that summer, the first one, uh, with I think it was Claire de Lune, was the music in it. And we were like, this is the most yes. beautiful trailer I've ever seen. Oh, my God. And I was, uh, I was at Comic-Con, but I, I didn't get to see the trailer in the room. So I was like just walking down the street and someone texted me, it was online, so I watched it on my phone. I told Mike later that I do, I saw the trailer. I we were walking, I, I stopped, I watched a couple times on my phone. He's like, You watched it on your phone? I was like, <laughs> I'm not home. It's on my phone or not. So yes, I watched it on my phone. And it's awesome. Okay? I'm gonna watch it on my TV when I get home. Leave me alone. <laughs> and got to meet a bunch of people there at Comic Con and um became friends with a lot of people there. Oh man, that's where I became friends with Richard Taylor at, at Wedding Workshop, who is a, such a sweet man. And, and I've looked up to his work and him for so long. And it was a great Comic-Con getting to meet so many people. Um, and then a lot of conventions when it came out in 2019. And, and then this is our first one that we're getting to do since 2019 together. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be fun. Godzilla fans are awesome. Man, I mean, there's like 60 plus years, 30 plus movies there, and people come from all over the world. When like literally, like people have people have told us at conventions in America that they flew in from Japan to meet us, and we're like, no, you didn't. You didn't come here. Just, you're here, and you also came here. There's no way. But the, the fans are amazing, and it's it's generations. It spans from kids to grandparents. It's so cool. What is your favorite Godzilla movie? Well, I have to say Godzilla King of the Monsters because I'm in it. Um, <laughs> and uh, the first one I ever saw, which Kurt Carley plays Godzilla, who's a friend of mine, who is in Shallow Water. Uh, he played Godzilla in the Matthew Broderick one mm. in the, um, back in the 90s. That was the first one I saw. I saw that in theaters. Um, I've seen the original. I've seen Ghidorah, uh, the, the three-headed three -headed monster is the official title, yes. I think. Um, yep. I loved the one with Brian Cranston from 20, what was it, 14? Yes. I've not seen all 34, however many there are. Um, mine, uh, the one that I'm in is obviously very special. And when you go back to the original one, I, I think just especially when you, you, you compare it to the time it came out in and the, the, the message that it had and the reason that it was made, it's very special. And considering it started this whole line of films, not even Godzilla, but other films that have been based on God, and, and this whole mess of characters, it wouldn't be here without that first one. So I, I, I'd, I'd probably say probably the first one or Ghidorah, the three-headed dragon, since that's the first time you see Ghidorah come in. 
Um, but they all they're all special for their own reasons. It's hard to oh, yeah. favor. Working with motion capture, typically, it's just you wearing some like spandex PJs, basically. So you really have to embody the weight more. And you're also typically playing something that is not your size. Like Ghidorah's like 500 feet tall. So, and, and technically it's not even like from my feet, technically like my feet are his feet, my arms are his wings for us. But like, it's kind of like from my waist to my head is like his whole neck. So like there's different things you have to think about with that. Whereas when you're, when you're in a costume, when you're in prosthetics, when you're in a creature suit, you're here, you're there. It is what it is. You have to imagine a certain, and not, not more, but in a different way with motion capture because with George, we're very atomically, uh, Atomically and anatomically, uh, we're very close in body. I can't think of the right word um, to gorillas. So there's not a whole lot you have to do. There's a there is a weight to it. There's a gravitas to it. They have a weight to them that we don't have. Um, um, but and then and then Ghidorah is just totally different. But then when you're when you're in a creature suit as well. I mean, when you're in motion capture, you have your face, you have your hands. When you're in a creature suit, you know, like in Hellraiser or Chatterer, I could see through that. And you can't really breathe. It's a lot hotter, it's a lot heavier. I've worn stuff that weighed up to 160 pounds. I, I've worn things that took eight hours to put on. Um, I've worn things where you're, it's claustrophobic, it's, so it's it, it, there are a lot of each one is different too, but the practical restricts you in a lot of ways and informs how you can move. There, there are just certain things you can't do when you're when you're in practical effects. But I also I like I like practical effects because it's right there in front of you, man. Ah, you just it's right there. You look at chatter, chatter is like I'm right freaking here, man, and. <laughs> But with you know George or something like that, you're looking at me with some dots in my face, maybe a camera, a camera on my head, and we're in PJs, and I got to see these arm stilt things, and um, and so I have a I have a job there to really help Dwayne look into my eyes and see someone in something different. So they're all different. I would say it is most of the time, nine times out of ten, more challenging to be in, in special effects make. I'm trying to think of a situation where it was harder doing motion cap, which for me it hasn't been. It's it's 99% of the time harder when you're wearing prosthetic makeup and creature suits and it's sweaty and it's hot and it hurts and you're being poked by something or it's heavy. Uh, you can't see, you can't breathe, you can't go to the bathroom, you can't like, it's a lot harder in the practical stuff. But I like that challenge and it helps you also become the character a little simpler maybe because you literally feel like something, someone else in this thing and you feel separated from everyone else more because you're wearing, you feel like you're wearing a bucket on your head. <laughs> and those moments between action and cut, with that, everything goes away. And especially with chatter, it's just like, freaking, I'm coming. Um, yeah. So it's a difficult, it's, diff it's, diff it's impossible to explain until you're actually in one. And right. then you get in one, you're like, oh my gosh, this sucks. It's like, yep. Yep. This is the worst day of my life. Yep. Pretty much. But they've all had their own challenges. They've all had their own unique challenge. Like with Death Note, it was a challenge because I'd never had that that amount of responsibility in such a big project. And so I was very nervous. So I had to have confidence and have belief that I could do it and prepare. And, and, and really do the best that I could. Plus, balancing. Like Doug Jones gave me some really great advice before that. He said, you're not going to be the voice. But you have to pretend like you are. Because whoever they get, which ended up being Willem Dafoe, is never going to be on set. So you're the only, you can't, you can't halfway prepare. You're the only person that the other actors have to look into the eyes and act with. 
you have to prepare the lines and the voices if it is going to be yours. Because also, even though it won't be, how I'm talking right now, the rhythm, the cadence, how I'm making sure you're understanding every word I'm saying, how I'm moving my hand and my head and my body and my shoulders and everything with how I'm talking, my voice makes me move the way I do. I can't just separate it and just be physical. And so he said, that's gonna be on camera. And then whoever they do get to do the voice is going to have to match your physicality, hit the points that you're hitting with your physicality. I'm, I'm over exaggerating my physicality here, but like they can't, they're gonna have to match 90% of what you do. I was like, oh crap, that's a lot of responsibility. So that was a that was a whole challenge in and of itself there. Plus it was very hot, very hot and sweaty in that thing. Holy crap. Like sometimes they'd have to cut and like dry me off because they're like, yeah, sweat's dripping off your face and we're gonna have to visual effects out sweat drops. Uh, so we, we can't do that. Um, yeah. And Rampage was challenging because you can compare me to Andy frickin' Circus. You can compare me to Toby Kebbell and Karen Conable and all Terry Notary and all these people that have played. And some people are like, who are they? Look them up, they're in Planet of the Apes and all that stuff. You can compare me now, you can compare me to a gorilla. And so I, I had to bring my frickin' A game. So I was so nervous, I wanted to do the best job I could. And you're opposite Dwayne Johnson, how many people are gonna watch this movie? And so there's a lot of pressure, but I had to take that on and, and just have that confidence. Um, and that, in this one, it is my voice. Oh, 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 oh. It is my voice. So I have to, I gotta sound like a freaking gorilla. Great. Um, I gotta know sign language. I gotta, there's all this stuff. And then Terry trained me, but he wasn't able to be on set because he was already committed to Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. So that was a whole challenge. And to, and, to, and to become a gorilla like that, it is exhausting physically. It takes a lot of focus just being present and being in the moment and breathing and looking out of your eyes like a gorilla. And then Godzilla was a challenge because like, okay, I'm, there's three of us that play one character. How do we do this? How do I not, how do I be my own, but we're together? How do I prepare for the head of a dragon? Like what? And so just having to figure that out. Um, and then Chatterer is, is, is such a, was such a challenge because there were some times where I couldn't go to the bathroom for seven hours. Just hold it. Just hold it. Um, I'm in this stuff in, in 100 degree heat for some of the days. Perfu sweating through inch thick silicone rubber. How is that possible? How does that work? Um, or outside in the, in the cold overnight once it got colder as the fall came. And we're outside at like 3 in the morning. Um, or like I'm having a head splitting headache because of the head. I had a vice grip on my head. And, and, then, and you can't see... And you don't know when you're going to get to go to the bathroom and you don't know what time is it? Oh my God. We have like nine more hours to go <laughs> and then two more days tomorrow. <laughs> Why am I doing this? And like, but this is your scene. So you have to, you got to push through. You can't quit. They need the freaking scene and you can't halfway do it. You got to look like you're not tired from action to cut. You got to freaking say, let's freaking go. I got this. Let's do it. And you got to just... And just time and time again, you know, you're in there, Jason, ready? Oh, and stand up and go and, and go do this. And it's just, so it's a mental battle. They all have different challenges. And then we all had horrible allergies over there because there's plants over there that we're not used to. And we're outside in the woods overnight. And we're just, just snot um, and getting colds. And so there, there's always, there's all these different challenges. It's always, and then, and then you have to create the character. Yep. On top of all that. <laughs> and so it's all that plus character, which is already a struggle in and of itself because no two characters are the exact same. All that and you still have to act, which that's tough if you're in an air conditioned room in a class. So like, and it's just, it's constantly, David Bowie said he always does his best work when his head is just barely above water. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable and it's challenging, but it's doable. And that's where you get the best out of yourself when you're like, I don't know how I'm freaking gonna do this. So they, and that's just to name a few things. And the shallow water and the freezing cold for four hours in the water, you can't feel anything. I almost, I didn't almost drown, but I was definitely 
caught underwater for 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 and it couldn't get up for a period of time. So that was that was that was not fun. Um, and they had to pull me up and yeah, that was it was like yeah, <laughs> give me a second, we can do another take. Holy crap, because the sun's going down, we have to get a take. So I can't just say I don't want to do it anymore. Like no, we need to do it. We, you're counting on me. We're not, this is the day. Um, so it's always a challenge, but I love at the end of the day where you just come out out of it. And you're like, ah, I'm a beast, and we did it. You know, and you just feel you're high fiving people, and it feels so good to overcome that stuff. And you grow through it, and you get better. And so I, I'm always excited about what's the next challenge going to be. Everything is a challenge. Um, so it's really, and then there's other projects. I don't know that I don't know what the most challenging. They're all. I always think I've had the most challenging, and then something else comes up. I'm like, oh crap. This is a whole other ballpark of challenge. So they're always they're always challenging. But the challenges grow you. They don't happen to you. They happen for you to make you stronger. But I love all that stuff. Brian Steele, who has played countless, like, like a half a dozen characters between Hellboy 1 and Hellboy 2. He's been the Predator before. He's the, the robot in the Lost in Space Netflix series. He's been so many different things. He said, pain is temporary. DVDs are forever. Well, because DVDs aren't forever. But once the film is finished, it's finished. So put it all on the line. No one's died inside of a creature suit before. Push through. You've got more in you than you think. Think of what the Navy SEALs and so many other people do. Like, I haven't even I haven't even touched my potential yet. Just keep going. Another thing that I would say there is is pain and like rejection are to are temporary. Regret is forever. Man, I wish I would have pushed harder on that day on set. I don't want to feel like that. I want to always leave it all there on set and be like, I did the best I could. I'm so freaking exhausted. I love everybody. I'm going to sleep. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh my God. Like, I want to feel like that. I don't, I don't ever want to be like, man, I wish I would, that, that didn't, that didn't look good. I wish I would have pushed harder. So I just, I love pushing myself. I'm such a glutton for challenge and difficulty. You and me, man. <laughs>
do not listen to one single person who says you can't do it or who laughs at you. I guarantee you nothing against them. I bet they haven't accomplished anything major because anybody who has will tell you, of course you can do it. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take having a big dream and not letting anybody change it or steal it. It's going to take great work habit, fantastic, most positive attitude and unwavering belief that if anyone's done it, of course you can do it. It's rare to see someone when they started when no one cared. We see them when they're on stage getting a award, but if anyone has any kind of a dream out there, go after it with everything you've got, work hard, and most importantly, probably, probably find as many people as possible, but you just need one who has already achieved what you want. Get around them, find someone who is willing and able to help you achieve the same results and just do what they did. It's a rest. There is no secret to success. It is not luck. It is a recipe. It is a diet. It is a workout plan. If you did what someone did, you will have similar results that they had. If a baker shows you, here's how I bake my cake and you never baked before, but you follow the recipe, you're going to have a pretty close to their cake cake. And if you bake it again, you'll get better. If you bake it again, you'll get better. And eventually you could probably bake a better cake than they did because they didn't start with that recipe. They formed it. And now you get to start with their recipe. But it's about getting around that person and use them like GPS and never stop moving. Get there and keep going and then help other people just like you were helped. Thank you so much for that. And thank you to the viewer or listener who has tuned in to this new episode of Toku Titan Cast. Uh, once again, I'm Davis Medole and I uh, want to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon as well as my channel members. And uh, that's all we have for now. Take it easy, y'all. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>